Hey, hello everyone, and welcome to today's Pollinator Week, Pollinator Week webinar, which is Beekeeping Gone Wild. My name is Caitlin, and I am one of the conservation educators here at the town, and I will be hosting the webinar tonight. But first, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathering today, although virtually, on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy members, Siksika, Bikani, the Gainai First Nations, the Dene of Sutina First Nations, the Métis Nation Region 3, and all those that made Treaty 7 lands their home. Before we start, uh, you should all be able to access a Q&A function through Zoom, which can be just found at the very bottom of the screen. So add your questions in there as we're going, and we'll do our best to address them all. So now I will hand it over to our guest, Lexi Farmer, to introduce herself and get us started. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Lexi, or Alex, whatever, I have a few different names depending on where you know me from, and I'm going to be talking to you tonight, uh, a bit of a different spin. Uh, I've done a number of talks over the last decade or so on sort of, you know, this is your bee diversity, this is this and that is that, and and when I do these talks, I tend to try to throw in little bits of, oh, and then this happened with this colony, or, you you know, little stories I like to tell, but I never get to really embellish on my stories, <laughs> because I'm always trying to keep it sciencey, I guess. And so tonight I thought, well, to heck with it, I want to actually get people excited about watching native bees. Um, and so I'm going to tell you stories. Tonight's more of a storytelling, show and tell, weird things I've seen, cool things, yucky things, whatever. But uh, so do feel free to ask questions. Uh, it won't be all encompassing because I haven't actually had the chance to experience all 321 species of bees in Alberta, but I'll do my best to show you what I've seen in my own backyard. So I called it beekeeping gone wild. Uh, I know that most people, when you hear the word bees, you think honeybees and certainly the Save the Bees campaign. And, and, and so um, there's this whole big focus on honeybees. And this is something that I've always noticed as long as I've studied bees. And so um, I'm stepping away from that and I'm, I'm focusing on you know, more, mostly actually bumblebees, but I am going to get into some other interesting things that I've seen. I've kept my screen on this sort of format because I'm going to be bouncing into video clips, um, videos that I've put on, on my own Facebook page, so I'm sure all my friends love how I'm always posting videos of bees, but I wanted to be able to, instead of just showing you pictures, I wanted to actually show you some of these cool interactions that you can see if you actually go out and just watch your own native bees in your in your backyard. So um, this is the beekeeper this is sort of the you know, ins and outs of wild bees in your yard and things that you can do to help encourage them. Uh, I got into this back in uh, 2010 um, when I went back to uh, U of C to do graduate studies and so I started um, my project was looking at the effects of clear-cut logging as you can see here um, on bumblebee abundance and diversity. Uh, bumblebees are actually one of the most predominant pollinators within boreal forest habitats so they uh, account for almost 80 percent of that pollinator pool so you can imagine that if, if we're making these massive alterations to that landscape that that might be having big impacts on how bumblebees distribute themselves and you know which which patches of, of vegetation are getting good service and which ones aren't and so that's the reader's digest version of my thesis and then I have this little jumble of you know all the outcomes <laughs> sure but I just that was that was my project but one of the things I did during my project is I used nesting boxes so this was a unique project um, in that this was as far as I know, one of the first ones uh, in Alberta anyways, where uh, nesting boxes were used as a way of assessing um, sort of the colony success of bees in response to their landscape. And so I would go out and I'd put these bumblebee nesting boxes all over Kananaskis country. Um, and I did this early, early spring because uh, the bumblebees, the queens that you see, um, say in April, um, early May, these are ones that have actually overwintered since last uh, fall, so they were the new queens that had been produced and they mated and then they hibernated all winter long and all the other bumblebees within that colony died. So in the springtime when you see these great big bumblebees, those are all queens and so they come out and they're nest hunting and one of the things that we know from eons of research is that they will nest hunt on, on logs, on, on trees and especially you know more so um, 
uh, deciduous trees, so this is actually a conifer and old spruce, but here I am hanging up one of my boxes oh so long ago. <laughs> so I did this for three years, actually, um, and then just looked at the results of how the colonies grew. Um, but the sideline of that is that in working with these boxes so much, uh, and the first season I had so much uptake of these nest boxes, I think in my own mind I didn't think that any of this would work. <laughs> so when I came home with a, a, a truckload of, of bumblebee colonies because my supervisor had said, oh, they'll all die by the end of August, and I had brought home these all these live, massive colonies of bumblebees, um, it just spurred this this amazing love of these creatures. And so... You know, I could just do show and tell pictures of bees all day long, but I know that's not what you're here for, although you partly are going to have to. Um, but this was the first time I actually saw a queen coming back to a nest box, so that almost made me cry. And, you know, just the weird things I saw in that first season, things I didn't even understand. Um, and so this, this is the entrance hole to a nest box. And what's happening here is that as this worker is coming inside, there's another bee, another female worker bee that's watching and checking and she uses her antennae to sniff her and make sure that she you know or antenate her to make sure that she is actually a member of this colony and then that will allow her to gain access to the the box um, you know the, this is actually one of the first pictures I took inside of a colony box when I brought it home I actually got stung this is the one and only time I got stung by bumblebees um, but I had to actually use tweezers and pull out all the worker bees that were still inside and put them into a jar very, very quickly. <laughs> so grabbing them by their legs and putting them away, and one actually kind of got away, and it just came up, and it just brushed my nose so lightly. It didn't even barely feel it, and I kind of giggled, and within seconds, I was in, in excruciating pain. My, my children were with me at the time, and they all laughed at me. <laughs> but one of the neat things you can see here as well is that I've got all these little honey pots. And so that's another really cool thing about bumblebees that, you know, most people don't know is that they actually do make honey. So even though they're an annual species, and I mean, you think about, you know, honeybees are the mass honey producers, no question. Um, but because we have these annual species, when they make honey, they only make enough to last them a few days, maybe a, a week at best. Um, if a new queen is really smart, when she's actually founding a nest in the early spring, she'll actually go out and collect nectar and pollen. Now, the pollen is kind of like the meat and potatoes that she needs that for, for cell production. And each of these little balls are called cells. Um, and then the, the nectar is, of course, used to make this honey. Um, if she's smart, she'll actually make a couple, two or three honey pots just to make sure she can sustain um, herself as well as whatever she's producing uh, because we all know that our springtimes are so nasty and we can have days and days of rain, if not snow. So you know, these were all things I kind of learned as I went along. And I'm going to show you some cool videos of, of this too. And so what you're really seeing here is a whole bunch of workers. Um, you might notice right around now that we're going to have this big drop in the amount of uh, big bumblebees you're going to see. And there's there's sometimes even this sort of lull period when you're kind of like, oh, where did all the bumblebees go? This year, I don't know, because this year it seems to be like the biggest insect year I've ever seen in my life. Um, but usually we have this strange lull, and then the workers come out. So when these queens come out and they're out foraging, um, they're grabbing all this nectar and pollen, and then they're making these wax balls, and she's laying eggs in them, and she's putting in provisions, food food for them. And then there's this this lag period before these workers actually emerge and start foraging. So at some point here in the next near future, you might notice that now the bumblebees look smaller, and that's when you're going to be seeing all the workers. So for some species, I'm already seeing that, uh, and for other ones, uh, not so much, but it's, it's a really neat progression to watch. The other thing that's really cool, if you look at these pictures, uh, is that you can see I have, you know, some of these cells are, are pretty, you know, not, not overly big. I put this dime in here just to, so you'd have some sort of scale reference. Um, this picture's at the exact same sort of magnification, um, but we also have these massive cells in here. So these would represent the new queens or new gynes being produced. And so this is how we kind of, I guess, sort of 
determine colony success? How many new queens do we have to go into next season? Um, this season's huge abundance of, of bees and, and wasps <laughs> is really a product of last summer's how good were the conditions, coupled with you know what were the overwintering conditions like. But uh, really, it's it's to do with that. So this is one way that we can look at how how successful the colony is. So if you were participating in something like the bumblebee monitoring program, I'm assuming that some people that are here tonight have been to previous talks and you, you know about that. Maybe you're already a member of the monitoring program. Program. So that these are the kinds of things that we're really interested in. How big was your colony and how many of these super big <laughs> cells did we get in there? Um, you know, other cool things that I noticed is I could actually tell roughly how big a colony was by just how much of this poop I had on the outside. So bumblebees, um, they'll go outside of their nest box uh, to release feces and so this will sort of accumulate on the outside of the box. Um, but that's different from what I had happening over here. And this was kind of a unique thing that happened in my second year. And I have a video to show you of this, but this was actually a colony that grew in my mother's backyard. And um, these bees are actually coming out and they're spitting out the pollen that they had collected. So I thought that was really interesting. I'd never seen, well, I hadn't seen anything before, but I'd certainly never seen them removing their own resources, which of course made me wonder about contamination and things like that. And I've, I'd asked other people about this and we, you know, the jury's out on as to what was going on there, but you know, likely there was something, something wrong with this pollen, so. Um, so all of this work with those nest boxes, especially that first year, uh, it spurred both a, uh, you know, a, a sort of a desire to keep working with them as well as a hopefully lifelong friendship uh, with uh, a, uh, another lab mate of mine, uh, Megan Evans. So Megan Evans is the president of the Alberta Native Bee Council and really the heart and soul. Um, and we actually started way back in 2010 just making nest boxes. And we decided that we really noticed that people couldn't differentiate between wild bees and commercially reared bees. Um, and so we wanted to do everything we could to get the word out. And we, you know, we've spent so much time and energy and, and our own money just making all these nest boxes and giving them away and going to different little, like, I don't know, parade days and things like this, um, just trying to raise awareness about, uh, hey, we've got all these cool native bees. And uh, maybe for when you're in a town where, where you know, native bee abundance can be very high, right, where they're surrounded by agriculture, which is really quite owned by honeybees, but our little towns and our cities, these can be a, a actual a little treasure trove of, of diversity and, and native bee abundance. And so that was sort of the beginning of our crusade. Here you can see Megan at one of our little talks that we did, trying to explain the differences between the managed bees. And of course, then by 2017, she spearheaded um, the Alberta Native Bee Council. And so this week for Pollinator Week, you know, we're certainly having our own um, big, exciting events, and I'll talk about those in a bit. But you know, that's that's that was the beginning of the journey, I guess. So. Um, but what I want to do is, is get into some of these cool things that, I, that I've seen. Um, and again, I had to do it this way because I had so many videos that was kind of like, how am I gonna, how am I gonna actually show all these to you guys? So <laughs> I'm just going to keep bouncing back and forth within this little screen. It might be a little choppy, but it'll get the job done. <laughs> and so what you can see here, this is inside of one of those colonies. To mute my son. <laughs> and look at here, you can see this larvae. So this is bumblebee larvae. You know when you hear that song, I'm picking up my baby bumblebee. So there's those little maggots writhing around inside those cells. And that, that's your baby bumblebee right there. And so they need provisions, they need warmth to grow. And you can see this worker here, she's vibrating her muscles to generate heat. And so the more heat and the more nutrients these bees get, uh, the bigger they can get. And there are instances where workers can be produced and they're so big um, that they can actually fight the queen for, for um, taking over the, the, the colony. So it's not all sunshine and, and lollipops uh, in bee world, I guess. <laughs> um, another cool little video clip here. So in this one, oops, if it opens, hopefully this isn't a big problem. <laughs> but this is the first time I've tried to do this this way. Usually I'm always like, oh, you should see this video I have, and 
I, I wish I had better technology and, well, frankly, more time, but I'm not sure I can get this to open. So I can try one. This one is actually really quite humor. I show this one when I go to um, uh, different uh, uh, school groups. I do a lot of work with school groups. And so with this one, I had actually um, filmed a colony that was on the back deck. And this colony, uh, it was very hot, right? Oh, this is a south-facing yard. And south south yards are always good for putting out nest boxes but the queen comes out and she's quite irritated and so she's going to push past these workers um likely what you're seeing with that sweeping back and forth is actually of a male but here's the queen and she's actually going to kind of swing around and you can see that now she's <laughs> she's making sure she didn't um, mess the inside of the nest box so i just thought it was an odd thing to catch on camera but i thought it was you know whenever i show that to the, the school groups they're like oh wow cool <laughs> so i had to show you too i'm sorry <laughs> um have another one here this one i'm not sure why these were open this one um i might have to actually go into my uh Sorry, I think I'm going copy instead of open. Sorry. All right. <laughs> this one is actually them cooling themselves off. So this is in my mother's yard again. This is back to her colony. Uh, it, it's also a south-facing yard, but her box, because of your beginners uh, at this, was in a bit of didn't get enough relief. And so in this, you can see that they're all outside of the nest. Uh, they're fanning themselves. They're just way too hot. Um, and, and so it was just really interesting to watch this. Um, and again, you can see all this pollen that they've spit out. Uh, I think, I don't know if I cut it off a bit too soon, where you actually see a worker come out and you see her sort of spit, spit out this, this pollen. And like I said, it was a very strange uh, behavior. And I, I sent this to a few people, but we never did quite figure out what was going on there. So that was kind of interesting. I also, this year, I was lucky, if this is the right one, I'll have to see. Um, let's be a different one. Oh yes, this is it. So this is this was a neat thing. I've never had this happen before, but like I was saying, with our our call with our last summer was just so fruitful or or whatever. Um, there was just this huge abundance of food, and so my nest box was actually leaking bumblebee honey and it was one of the first times where I could actually take a little test tube and I put it outside of the the nest box and just let it sort of drip into this little test tube so I actually got to enjoy some honey but this is a good video because you can see the tongue of this bumblebee and bumblebees have all different tongue lengths and that's another thing that's really important um I get asked a lot of times well why is all this biodiversity so important you know my my husband certainly jokes that you know, survival of the fittest and, and if you can't survive the heck with you and uh but you know the, the the bottom line is that biodiversity um is the key to resilience and so you have all these different tongue lengths which can pollinate all different um shapes and sizes and depths of native flowers that they were evolved with and they're adapted to do so with um that if you just had monoculture cultures of bees uh, could not be achieved. And what we've seen in places where um, oops, I think I just said one, where native bee diversity has declined um, is that we actually see a decline in native plant diversity along with that. So it, it's certainly worth preserving that that diversity and making sure that we you know we're not reliant too reliant on any one species of bee to be doing the work. Um, this was another interesting experience, and so this was back in 2018, and one of the things that we never, ever encourage or even really offer to do uh, is any kind of sort of bumblebee nest recovery. So, um, you know, bumblebees, along with most of our native bees, are very, very docile. Uh, I mean, I think yellow and black stripy things have a bit of a bum rap for being aggressive and nasty, and certainly they can sting, but they don't want to sting. I mean, they're predominantly nectivores, so they forage for nectar and, and pollen, and they're not interested in our, you know, us as, as meat, right? So not like wasps as, as being carnivorous species. And so 
you know, where possible, we always try to encourage people, you know, hey, these, this colony isn't going to be here very long. If you can tough it out, a, you know, a little while and, and just sort of avoid them and, you know, it should be fine and then just plug that entrance. But in, in, in instances like this, this, this was actually a nest that was right in the floor of a, a child's uh, playhouse. And, of course, they were coming up right into the box of the house and, and literally just swarming the inside of this house. And so it had become a, a hazard. Um, so, so we did have to come in, or I did have to come in. This wasn't a, a bee council endeavor by any means. <laughs> and, uh, and move this colony. And it was huge. I'd never seen one so big. So there was well over 250, pushing 300 um, cells in this colony. Uh, I'd never seen one that big. And in the, the big thing when you actually have to try to move a, a bumblebee colony like this is that um, if you don't do it at the right time, then you're going to have so many workers that are out foraging. Um, and then even though you've moved this colony, they're, they're very smart. They know exactly where their colony was. So they're going to come back and they're going to be looking for it. And probably even after I took as much as I could of this colony, um, there was probably dozens of workers that still returned to this nesting site. Um, I remember when I was out doing my field work out in Kananaskis, I had to take down my nest boxes at the end of summer. And so I always made sure I did it on rainy days, you know, cold days, because it was fall, uh, or else uh, early, early in the morning, this type of thing. But on one of the rainy days I went out, it actually got um, sunny uh, and heated up really quickly. And so I had to um, grab this box. I mean, it was, these are big, long drives and huge hikes into the middle of nowhere to take these boxes out. So there was no, oh, I'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I remember taking this box and plugging it and putting it into my backpack. I waited as long as I could. And then I started hiking away. Um, and when I turned around about you know, 20 meters, I looked back and there's all these little workers kind of swarming around the tree that this nest box had been at because they knew that this is where they should, uh, their home should be. So I had to go running back and pull this box out of the, my backpack pull the plug out and I just held it up and they all went inside and they didn't bother me at all they just you know they wanted their home and so I was kind of worried how many did I leave behind <laughs> and that is something if you read any of the literature on it certainly that's one of the concerns with moving a colony is you know, do you leave any how much of the colony do you, do you leave behind regardless of how careful you are because there's lots of instances where you can have workers that will overnight and some flowers or things like that so here is a video from the end of one of my seasons. And so this was kind of a neat one because the mating behavior uh, in bumblebees is pretty funny. They're not at all territorial bees. I mean, they're, they're, their main driving force for their distributions is just where's the food, right? And, and so um, the way I studied them was looking at how well they distribute themselves distributed themselves to match that, that food resource. But when the males are produced sort of later in the summer, um, they, they tend to get kicked out of the colony. And this is because the males, all they want to do is eat all the honey and they don't tend to forage for the colony. Uh, and they want to mate. <laughs> and so they're just a big nuisance. <laughs> and so they get booted from the colony. And so this is uh, really interesting because they just swarm back and forth where the nest is. They know the new queens are inside. And you can see like there's males fighting over, over these uh, new queens. And that was a big queen that just moved in there. I can kind of back up there. But um, from a distance, you can actually, if I had it panned out, I don't know if I have another video of this, there was actually more males just swarming. It looked, you know, like there was just this mayhem going on. And then the workers are usually there to guard and prevent the males from even getting back into the nest. And so they'll be shoving them out. So you can see these males are trying to get inside, but there's the, the, the female workers are going to have no part of that. They're going to get booted here. So um, it, it's, it's actually really Really entertaining to watch all this. I don't know, if, don't know if it's as entertaining for the new queens, but you know, again, this is the kind of stuff. If you're, if you're assumed, certainly last year with COVID, I had a whole lot of time to watch bees when I was working from home all the time, and so um, it was just really neat to have the opportunity to capture some of these moments because I get to see these things 
all the time just from because it's what I do but uh, you know most people don't actually get the chance to sort of who watch and, and see what's going on with the bees so one last one here if it works and so here's just another one coming up the tree and again stuck with a male and I think I tried to show some of the swarming around this one but look at the difference in the size too she is massive right these new queens are so big and the, you know the males are, are smaller um, so it's it's just a really interesting uh, dynamic um, <laughs> and I also like to spend some time just sort of dispelling some of the you know, mythology that I hear all the time um, and so uh, one of the things you'll see cute little videos on social media and stuff oh this bee high-fived me I saved it from a from a whatever and it high-fived me and I've I've had similar experiences certainly and I'm um, I'm really bad even as an ecologist I tend to want to touch everything <laughs> so if the bees are in my garden I'm always kind of poking at them and I get flipped the middle leg all the time and it's not a high five it's actually a warning language a body language because they're so non-aggressive um, they they actually do this as a way of saying you're annoying me and, and so it's not actually any kind of we, we personify everything but no she's she's really flipping you that middle leg <laughs> um, it's, the thing that I found interesting because my supervisor had told me about this back in my first or second year and I'd chuckled about it and I don't know if I ever did get um, a, a bee ticked off enough to do that at that point but um, my kids were very young at the time and I, we had a pool in the back a little kid pool and, and so it would always be attracting all sorts of different insects and so sure enough I had um, a whole bunch of different bees I had the like, sweat bees and mining bees and bees I didn't know what they were frankly well still I can't identify most bees but I can tell that what they are a bee <laughs> and uh, but you know if I rescue them from the water and I'd feel like yay I saved your life and then they'd flip me the middle leg <laughs> they really, like I was I, they saw me as a threat I was probably breathing my carbon dioxide all over them and so you know it was kind of interesting because that was the first time I found out that this isn't just a bumblebee body language this is a, a bee language I'd be curious to ask some honeybee people um, if this is something honeybees do too, if they kind of flip you a warning leg, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and another common myth I hear about bumblebees specifically as well is that they're too big to fly, that they defy the laws of gravity, I, you know, and even comments like, well, they're named bumblebee after all, they're not, they're not designed for good flight or efficient flight, and, you know, really nothing could be further from the truth. Um, and one of the really cool things that, you know, more recent studies of their sort of economics, their flight economics, uh, has shown is that not only are they some of the most efficient flying organisms on the planet, uh, but uh, the way they beat their wings, um, you know, if they need to... Uh, lift, you know, they, they'll, they'll increase the, the frequency of flapping that they do, um, so they can flap like 130 times per second, um, they probably get speeding tickets in playground zones, um, but then they can actually switch to this weird, uh, what the article I read referred to as an economy mode, where they can carry huge amounts of um, weight in, in pollen, in, in the form of pollen and nectar, and so 70, 80% of their own body weight. And when they do this, um, they found that they'll actually slow down the frequency of their wing beats um, and still create this, this lift and they call it their economy mode. And so now scientists are trying to figure out, you know, in part, you know, how are they doing this? Because, you know, now we're back to the mystery of they're just so darn efficient. But then the other thing is that, well, if they can switch to this weird economy mode, why don't they do it all the time, right? Because you'd think that that would just always be a better plan, but they tend to do it just when they have sort of these heavier things, and then they'll have a, a more rapid frequency wing beat when they're, when they're not so weighted down. So it's really quite very interesting and they can fly for kilometers you know to, to to get to a good hardy foraging area the other cool thing is that they have um incredible vision incredible visual acuity uh, and so 
you've, you've heard the saying, somebody making a beeline for something, and, and it's very true. They have these flight paths, they know where they're going, they know how to get back, and so if you get in the way of this, and if you've ever experienced this, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about, where all of a sudden you have a bee bump into you, and then now it's doing these big navigation circles around you. It'd be like if somebody planted a big you know, cottonwood tree in the middle of Deerfoot Trail. It's, 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 it's not supposed to be on the flight path, so we need to figure this out, right? So it's, um, and the, the speed of their vision is also something that's really unique. So if you've ever watched how fast a bee can go whipping across your yard, but when I say visual acuity, I mean that they can see within a patch of, you know, whatever type of forage, they can actually discern, you know, with good clarity, resolution, oh, that's, there's, there's good forage there, maybe I should hang a left and go back or something. So, you know, we really, the name bumblebee does, does bumblebees a disservice, but it comes from the name, you know, humble, which actually referred to the, the humming noise that they make from their vibrations. So, you know, just, you know, next time you hear somebody trash talking a bumblebee, you can tell them, now just wait a minute. <laughs> right. um, you know, certainly there's some sad things that I've seen too, though. So this is end of season when I go in to count my colonies. In this case, I consider myself lucky where I actually have cells left to count so a lot of times there's this window where you get in to get your colony out um, where it's all the workers are dead now um, and you can actually kind of pull this apart and count how many uh, bees are inside and, and get an idea of how many new queens you had um, but you wait one or two days too long and this whole thing can disintegrate because of different types of larvae that will take over the, the, the you know they're attracted to the sweetness so this, this is a great nutrient source for any other insect as well as rodents you know um, even little small uh, other small mammals and so um, it, they don't tend to hang around too long you're, you're you're really only just lucky if you find something like this intact in the winter uh, but what you can see here is that this colony it was incredibly fruitful so this was my one that was dripping honey um, but some of the bees didn't quite get to finish their season and I don't recall our, our fall being kind of a, a rapid thing so I, I think partly this is due to just running out of forage running out of food, running out of resources. And so you can see this little bulge here. This is actually a new queen and she was, you know, trying to you know, munch her way out of this cell. Um, never quite got out, so you can just kind of see her head poking out. So that's uh, sad for me. <laughs> um, I also found, you know, other worker cells, and you can see that little fluff in there. So again, just never uh, the, the season was over, and this is what was left. So, but these are, you know, they do provide great teaching resources, things that you can show uh, when I go and work with kids and stuff. And it, you know, I remember again my first season working with uh, the bumblebee colonies, and I brought home this beautiful orange bottom bees and um, you know we have uh, you know more than a dozen different uh, bumblebee species out here so 18 give or take and they're all different they, they really have quite different personalities that's another thing I found and so as far as whether or not they'll use my nesting boxes there's ones that seem to really really take them up quite readily so um, perplexus bees and, and vegans and nevidensis um, and if I get little tiny colonies and that's my little orange bottom bombus mixtus bees and so they might only make like 15 or 20 cells but then I have a good idea of which bee that is um, but the orange bottom bees are always just really friendly I don't know what it is so it can't be orange and then yellow like hunty eye they're they're not so friendly <laughs> but the the you know if you when you're looking at some of the keys that um, I'll show you a resource link to um, if it's like the orange bottom flava fronds or mixed just things like this they're just so friendly and I remember opening up one of these colony boxes again not realizing this is first year <laughs> that I shouldn't have and all these workers came out to greet me but not one of them was aggressive towards me it was just like you know what are you doing and so this was at the end of the season and a bunch of ants had tried to take over their colony and I used my hands and pulled it out because again like I said I'm terrible for <laughs> meddling um, and there was a new queen that was struggling to get out. So I always tell people that I performed this cesarean section because I cut the cell open and she was able to get out and fly away and hopefully mate and, and carry on the line. But I don't know. She never visits. So. <laughs> um, and this is another funny story because this was um, back, again, first year, one of my colonies I brought home. And I was 
again, trying to take pictures where I had good things that would give scale. And I wanted to show, look how big this queen is. And so I held up this loony, and then I thought I was super clever afterwards because I said, oh, here's a queen, and I've got a queen high-fiving a queen. Um, and so, you know, people would laugh. <laughs> um, but it, in fact, uh, this is actually um, a Cythera species. And so these are what we call cuckoo bumblebees. And I didn't know this at the time, but she was about to destroy my colony. And so they're kleptoparasites, so kind of like, um, like cowbirds with songbirds, where these bees don't form colonies uh, with, you know, with queens and workers and so on. So she doesn't get the, the right to be called a queen. Uh, but what she does have is a very strong, very powerful stinger. And so she can go in and fight the queen. Um, and I think this was a Bombus perplexus colony I had inside, so the perplexed bumblebee. And she, she killed my queen. And then what they do is they lay all their eggs inside of the left, the, the cells. So you saw those sort of opened pots that would then get new workers put inside. She lays all her eggs in those. The, the, the workers, they're none the wiser. They, they see larvae that need tending and they nurture and look after these and vibrate and protect them. And, but then all of a sudden you have this flush of perplexus bees and then the colony of course collapses and it's all mayhem um and so um and, and you know my kids again they grew up kind of watching all these things and and i was always telling them all the stories and so i actually took a nest box and i attached it to the outside of my dining room window and just put like a black sheet on the inside of the window so there was no wood there so we could peek inside and see what was going on and sure enough we got a colony and um but they'd heard the stories about the Cytheris, and so this was actually year two, I guess, because we were having lunch one day, and all of a sudden my little boy was like, Mommy, it's the evil Cytheris, and so I went running out of my wooden spoon, and I'm running across the yard, and I'm to get around the corner, and I'm yelling at you, get away from my nest, you, you evil bag, and all this, and of course my neighbors were out, and they thought, like I was insane, but so you know. But you know, the the big thing though, as as much as I hate to admit it, is that you know parasites or predators are actually a a, a sign of a again of a healthy ecosystem. And so, yeah, this is kind of a weird um, parallel, but you know, you look at something like an Ord's kangaroo rat uh, and a Western bumblebee. You say, well, what what do these two things have in common? And you know, sadly, it's that they're both listed. They're both endangered species. Um, but of course, you look at something like the swift fox, this is also an endangered species. And now here we see it running. Um, there's a big swift fox reintroduction program that went on to try and help bring back our swift fox populations. But now, of course, we see it running away with an endangered or it's kangaroo rat. So it's kind of ironic or sad. And, and so um, I don't know how in tune you are with some of the news in the last few years, certainly. I know COVID sort of dominated that, but back in 2018, oh gosh, I'm having a brain fart, or 2019, apologies, um, you know, with the um, introduction of the Canyon Meadows Bee Park, there was a whole bunch of research going on there, and I'll come back to talk about the Bee Park, but um, one of the researchers working with that was Lincoln Best, who's the best taxonomist on the planet, and so in their collections, they actually found this kleptoparasite, this gypsy cuckoo bumblebee, um, that actually uh, parasitizes the western bumblebee. And so the neat, sort of neat story uh, in this is that both species had undergone massive declines over the last several decades. Um, the western bumblebee was our most predominant bumblebee. You know, it was the bee, right? So kind of like now you're seeing all these cryptic bumblebees everywhere. Um, you know, th but this, the western bumblebee, aptly named because this was the one that you would see the most. And so when its populations died off, the kleptoparasite, you know, the 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 gypsy uh, cuckoo bee, was never hugely abundant, but it just completely seemed to disappear. And so back um, a couple years ago in the bee park, they actually found some of it, I think they actually found two, um, foraging. And this was a big, important sign. This was actually a really good sign because the only way it, it could really come back is if its, its prey item was also coming back. And so um, one of the nicest things you know, for me is that uh, in recent years, I've noticed uh, I live out in Turner Valley 
And when I was doing my field work all through the entire eastern slopes of Kananaskis, so uh, from Sybil Flats, you know, Highway 40, all the way down through Etherington, um, and I saw a total of four western bumblebees in three years of going out in the census or surveying you know, every day. And uh, so that was very discouraging. But when I come to Turner Valley, I discovered that I must have had a nest uh, somewhere on my property because I always had western bumblebees. And so this was super exciting. And this went on for a few years and then they just vanished. Right. And so they must be a very sensitive species. Now, one of the things that happened was introduction of urban honey beekeeping in my area. And suddenly my apple trees that were flush with bumblebees became flush with nothing but honeybees. And so did that displace them enough? Who knows? The exciting thing is that this year is the first year I've seen them back here in Turner Valley again in in that I want to say eight year period. So that's exciting. And again, seeing the gypsy go along with it, I haven't seen any of these yet, although I might have. It's just been really hard because everybody moves so fast. <laughs> uh, but at my mother's house in Canyon Meadows, she has both Western bumblebees and cuckoo bumblebees. So it's these are positive signs that, you know, that we, um, you know, predators aren't always a bad thing, right? We need checks and balances in an ecosystem. And so if, if you have the predator, that means you have the prey. And so I'm trying to make it sound happier. <laughs> right. um, but then I started noticing other things. So, you know, when I garden, I tend to garden. I was always just thinking about bumblebees. And so I put in native plants and I'd think, oh, wait, I haven't seen any bumblebees on this plant. I don't want it. <laughs> um, but then I actually started, you know, after years, right, noticing other bees much more. And so this cute little green mason bee of some kind has been nesting in my dryer vent. And it's it's just the, well, the I should say the, what's this called, the mortar around my dryer vent. And so she comes and goes, and she comes so early in the spring that there's virtually, as far as I can tell, nothing out for her to forage on. But I mean, look at her, she's gorgeous. Um, and so every year that she comes and I start noticing her, I'm like, oh, no, she's here too early. There's no food. Uh, but the nice one nice thing about Facebook is that with those stupid Facebook memory things, I actually have this record now because I'm terrible at writing things down um, of every year she comes on almost the, they, they emerge, I should say, on almost the exact same day every year. So plus or minus one day this year was no different. And, and so she, they were thriving for a few weeks, and it's a very short window of time, and then that's it. And so as a solitary bee, you know, she goes out and collects provisions, and then she crawls back into my uh, you know, crack in my foundation here, and she's laying eggs and she's leaving provisions. Because she's a solitary bee, she's not you know, doing anything other than that. And so you, know, you just have to wait and see how many of her offspring uh, show up in the next season. But it's, it's just been the most amazing thing to watch. And, uh, I can spend hours just sitting outside staring at my, my dryer vent. So <laughs> I don't know. I need to get a life, I guess. <laughs> um, so one of the things that, again, because I just can't stop looking at me, uh, is that I, I just kind of started watching, you know, what are they doing? What are what are they, you know, in nature? What are they interested in? What are they, you know, if they're nest hunting, what, what characteristics are they looking for? And it's certainly, if they're looking in, in, in trees, they're looking for ones that have cavities in them. You know, for bumblebees, they can't produce their own cavities. For many, certainly not all, but for lots of our solitary bees, like our leaf cutter bees and so on, um, they'll utilize old um, holes, like especially for, from beetles and things, um, and just kind of go into those to, to put their provisions. So uh, they're looking for these cavities. And my son brought me home this log. <laughs> and, you know, other other mothers get flowers for Mother's Day, but I got this log. Only he knew I'd be so excited. Um, but he didn't explain why. So I, I thought he'd give me this cool hollow log, and I'm thinking, ah, should I make this into a birdhouse? Or maybe I should put a cover on it and, and a top and turn it into a bee house. So, you know, I was really excited about this until he's like, well, no, that's, that's not why. He's like, you know, flip it over. And when I flipped it over, when they cut into the log, there was all these different leaf cutter and mason bees uh, nesting in, in the whatever type of wood boring beetles had made chambers uh, in this log. So, you know, this is what they actually nest in in nature. And that was just the coolest thing for me because, again, I don't 
I just didn't get to see this, right? So I could see where I had leaf cutter bees and then I used tweezers and I pulled out bits and pieces. <laughs> so here's the butt of a mason bee. I don't know what kind. <laughs> here's a wrapper. So um, the, the research I did, you know, looking at the different types of structures they produce, leaf cutter bees, they're, they're making this more like a nice leafy thing that they stitch together. And inside each of these, I call them little cabbage rolls. Um, she is pr putting food provisions, um, laying an egg and then she stitches these leaves all up makes a little chamber and then goes off and, and cuts another leaf and so again um, I can open this link I actually took some videos on this it's probably at my mom's house because she had the best but you can see watch this leaf cutter bee look how fast she is she just chews that with her mandibles she rolls it up like a little sleeping bag and off she goes, like just gone. They're, they're so efficient. It's just amazing to watch them. I've actually watched them stuffing like, you know, the metal lawn chairs with the hollow metal lawn chair. I've seen them stuffing those. I see them go to all sorts of strange things. But so that's, you know, how you differentiate these leaf cutters from these, these mason bees. But then I'm like, well, what are these, you know, kind of ugly looking things? And, and these are also a type of mason bee. They're called um, resin bees. And so... I did something last year that I normally wouldn't do, but someone gave me this solitary bee box. I don't like calling them hotels because that implies this huge number of things. And I didn't want a huge number of things because I didn't want to do anything to encourage um, predators to come in and, and create a sink rather than a source. But I put this up and I thought, well, it's not too big and maybe I won't get any takers. And I actually got all these little shiny you know, well, I shouldn't say all these. I got four <laughs> tubes filled with something. So I was looking and I could see this stuff. And, and this was hugely exciting to me now because this is a whole new experience. What is this? Uh, I even accidentally tasted this. And it was very much a product of spruce trees. <laughs> um, and so uh, this overwintered. I, I tucked it away carefully to make sure that everything would survive. But in the springtime, I just, you know, the curiosity got the better of me. For one thing, I didn't know what would produce this because all I'd ever seen was this, you know, was the leaf cutter, was the mason bee. So what were these weird, what was this weird shiny stuff? And so I got in touch with um, um, uh, Jess, Dr. Jess Frustuck, and that uh, she told me, oh, this is probably a resin bee. And so because fortunately, uh, Betty Beswick with the Alberta Native Bee Council had recently put out these incredible resources onto the Bee Council page, I started looking at, you know, this is the fun stuff you can do, right? I started looking at her resources, trying to figure out, well, who uses resin? So I you know, did a little search and I found these dianthidiums and I thought, well, that, that sounds really cool. Maybe it's them. There's only a few of them. So that would really limit what they would be. And then look at this thing. Like, it looks just like a wasp. You would think that uh, I actually had wasps uh, if, if you saw this just in your garden. Uh, the other cool thing I learned in researching this uh, is that the males are actually bigger than the females. So unlike those other pictures I showed you with the bumblebees, and, and something that I just thought was a general rule within, um, you know, insecta and arachnids and so on, was that the males were always much smaller than the females just because the females provide all the resources. And the other cool thing is that the females are always appealing to the males, so the males are always swarming to mate with females, even if they've already mated. Um, so it's kind of, from a me as a nerdy biologist standpoint, you know, it'd be, uh, it's just kind of interesting to know that right up till the last go, there, whoever's had mated last would probably be getting to fertilize the eggs. So. Um, at any rate, I wanted to kind of point out to you, and this is a picture I always show. I can't not show this to people because you really have to have a, a an understanding of just the mimicry and, and the diversity between bees and wasps and, you know, flies if you care. But, I mean, it, bees evolve from wasps, and there's more species of wasps than there are bees out there. Typically, this is all anyone ever thinks of when they think of wasp is just a, some crappy little yellow jacket. And, and so but the one that I was looking at looked very much like this. Um, these, this image is from the book, The Bees in Your Backyard. So if anything I'm telling you about today, you know, again, just sort of storytelling is interesting to you, um, you really should get this book. I have I've hours of my life have poured into my book. It's mangled now, but it's such a great resource. And it shows you distributions of bees. So when you sit and narrow down what you might have to 
you know, a small two or three hundred possibilities. You could look and see if it actually exists in your location. <laughs> At any rate, it couldn't have been this bee <laughs> because when I did some more research, there should have been other things in mixed with the resin. So I went back to uh, the bee council's page and I narrowed it down further that because it was just resin in between the little chambers that were produced, it could only be these two types of mason bee. The names are kind of funny, like a smallpox sculptured bee and so on. Um, but I never got to find out which it was. So I thought, well, I'll look at these and I'll wait for something like this in my yard. Um, so here we can see, you know, the, the um, this is the smallpox bee, <laughs> the Carinata. Um, but when I went back and I started looking at my resin um, tubes, I noticed little black flecks. And when I cut into them, every single one had been parasitized. And so in most cases, I didn't even have bee larvae left. So while those other ones, um, they don't overwinter as larvae, these ones do, but the larvae had been destroyed because every time that resin bee went off to get new, new reserves, some solitary wasp came in and laid her eggs um, so that they could feed on my resin bees. And so it's this sort of vicious cycle. But again, you have to remember that you know, predators and prey, that this is all part of the, the great circle of life. And... It was also a good learning experience. <laughs> so, um, but one of the big things I also want to emphasize here, and this is something, because uh, you, you, you just get so much gimmicky stuff thrown at you nowadays, and certainly these bee hotels are, are one of them. And so uh, much of this would be of no use to, um, to, to a bee, right? I mean, I, actually, I did read about a bee that will nest in a pine cone, but I'm going to ignore that comment. But, so uh, in our cold, cold climates, uh, these are useless, and, and they're very short. And how would you clean this out? These are probably all glued into the backs, and these are all wired in so you if you are going to produce something for solitary bees um, you want to make sure that you follow some very specific guidelines and so Megan Evans did a ton of research into this and best practices for okay you, you might want to have a few solitary bees or encourage that um, their occupancy but here's the best way to do it so making sure you can clean these things out the same way we do our bumblebee nest boxes making sure that they're deep enough making sure that the back is sealed off and just all these different types of things so that you know, anything that we do to enhance our native bees, we don't want it to end up to become a, a sink, sort of a negative for the bees instead, right? So, you know, all these things that I look at, and I have to say that every year I'm noticing more and more and more diversity, and it just blows my mind, um, and, you know, different, seeing different things. Like the second I put out my zucchini plants this spring, they were full of bees, and it's like, well, what kind of bee is this? And I sat with my bees in my backyard book for hours and hours and couldn't come up with a species name, so it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> um, you know, this is a, a cool little leaf cutter bee that we rescued from the neighbor's driveway, and the way I know it's a male is because he's got these big puffy pads on his front uh, legs. And so when, when they're mating, um, when he's mating with a female, he'll reach around and he'll kind of stroke her eyeballs or cover her eyeballs. It's very romantic, right? And, of course, you know, here's my green bee and my colonies. And this year has been the most incredible colony year of all. Um, but, you know, the best ways you can do that is to just create habitat. So this is a... Um, Again, a cool slide I stole from Megan, but this is actually my, my yard on the right here. And so I had just nothing but lawn. Um, and so what I do is every day when my husband would go to work, I'd go out and I'd dig out more lawn. And so now I have no lawn, at least on the one half of the yard, and it's just all flowers. And uh, regrettably, you know, a bunch of these are not native plants, but I do have tons more in here. I just couldn't capture it all. So you know, really is losing the idea that this is somehow in any way of any kind of ecological value. And really, like I said, our, our urban settings are becoming almost like lifeboats for our native uh, insect diversity, right? Because this is to get away from all the commercially reared insects um, and, and give them a place to, to get a leg up, so to speak. So numerous studies from all different places have shown that you know, gardens and, and native plant gardens especially are you know utopia to, to our native species so the more diversity you have um, the more the more bees you're going to get the more pollinators you're going to get right and and more so it, it's all about planting those native plants as much as possible so uh, again uh, the Alberta Native Bee Council is posting um, a big I think they did it today actually uh, you know the the dirty dozen <laughs> as they call it and so it 
it's just uh, what are the most valuable native plants you could give your your native bees. And this is actually a picture of forest. This isn't this isn't a garden. This is beautiful forest, aspen forest that I worked in uh, on one of my field sites. And you can imagine that it was flush with with all different native bees. And so it, it's really about getting those native plants in, having them in early in the spring, especially pollen producing plants. And and pollen also becomes super important in the fall again, especially for our colony forming native bees. Um, but here you can see a big juicy hunty eye with big pollen baskets on her leg, um, you know, prairie smoke and lousewort and um, geraniums and, and uh, uh, paintbrush. So just, you know, all beautiful flowers. Um, also having an abundance, so having sort of mass flower and crops at any one time is nice. Again, I couldn't capture that, and you know, I couldn't. I could do show and tell all day. But so just some examples. Certainly, uh, scorpion weed and things like that is on the their dirty dozen list. So, and that's one of the most beautiful flowers I've, I've ever seen. So, you know, it's kind of changing how we garden, leaving areas of your yard to become overgrown and kind of, you know, even your grasses to slump over because bees will nest inside of that um, so it, it does all of that provides nesting habitat here you can see I have nest boxes you know on the edges of my gardens there's mixed um, sort of reviews as to whether bees will nest near or far to the resources but both of those were used so I'm thinking it's very species dependent <laughs> um, and and we do see a lot of this we see you know pardon the weeds we're feeding the bees and that's you know that's awesome and i certainly see lots of native bees uh in my dandelions you can see my property line is here and it's like just full of dandelions and then my poor neighbor he has like the more like perfect yard god love him and uh he still likes us but um at any rate so i we have all these bees in here um and then they do use those and it does give them a leg up but again getting those native plants in there and and having an idea of the flowering phenology will really uh, do leaps and bounds for your native species. So this I this might have been updated already, but these native plant lists are going to be coming out as well as good sources for native plants. Um, if you're interested, I can certainly email you any of these resources. So um, I already have some that we've used, like for Turner Valley, we have a pollinator boulevard. And so um, like seaborne seeds and places like that are excellent, right? And of course, providing those nesting resources. And so that's been one of the fun things for me to watch is just all these crazy nesting you know they'll nest in hollow stems they'll nest in this is a nest box that Lincoln Best put out in the the um, Canyon Meadows Bee Boulevard um, there if you had areas in your yard of bare soil especially compacted bare kind of sandy soil they love they love that so they'll they'll nest in there and again here's a bumblebee kind of above ground one where they have net you know nesting in the slumped over grasses and stuff so it's just you know, providing those types of habitats. You don't even have to build structures, but just providing a diversity of habitats. Um, there's also some really cool information on the page. You know, what I was trying to do to sort of narrow down what I possibly could have had in my yard. And so this this is a, a, an incredible resource. I've had so much fun with it, and it's only been up a little while. But trying to narrow down just what what the heck is in my backyard? Because um, here I am, like being sort of sold as the the bee expert, but I I know this much about you know, something where we have. Twenty thousand plus 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 species of bee on our planet, so it's um it's it's all a big learning curve, right? Uh, just some of the fun things I've been playing with this season. I started you know making more hollow logs, so I looked for rotten logs, and I even for this one I I cleaned them all very well to make sure there's no rodent or anything kind of any kind of potential for disease, put in a little bit of upholsterer's cotton, set them out, and I even used the natural entrance on this one. Some of them I had to drill holes, um, and, and, and they get, they actually were very well received by the bees, so it's been really neat to, to watch all of these, you know, things you want to avoid, and part of the design for our nest boxes is to make sure that these holes are too small to have uptake by rodents, because we don't, you know, as 
as small as the risk might be, things like hantavirus are not something you mess with. So uh, we never, I never encourage getting like rodent infected uh, materials to attract a pollinator. And of course, certainly wasps, but this, this wasp colony right here is literally only about this big. Um, this is a native species of wasp, uh, very different from what you're probably used to seeing and completely docile. So, um, you know, didn't bother. It actually had bees nesting in with them, and they got along just fine. And I've seen that on several instances now, so I, I find that also very curious. So. And this is the Bee Boulevard. So if you're tuning in from Okotoks and you haven't checked this out yet, this is right in southwest Calgary. Um, it goes along Canyon Meadows and what's it called when it crosses Cloud Trail? I'm having a break. Bonavista? I think, or Bonaventure. Anyway, it's amazing. Uh, this is the vision of um, city employee uh, Dave Misfelt. And what's really curious is that he's not with parks, he's with roads. And he asked him, hey, you got all this kind of overgrown area. Can I make a bee park? And yeah, he like, go for it. And um, and it was him and his, his co-workers that literally put in I don't even know how much volunteer work, but they, they used all recycled materials. So this, all this what looks like gravel, this is all recycled crushed concrete. They put in sort of those sort of beds for, for mining bees to utilize. Um, they, they have these big bee hotels. Um, and then just for a couple kilometers worth of logs they brought in from uh, golf courses and stuff. And then they drilled holes in it. It's just been incredible work. And then planted, of course, all sorts of native flowers. And this has become an incredible spot for education purposes, too. So the University of Calgary is utilizing it, Mount Royal. We have, you know, they bring in school groups from all like adjacent schools. Um, so just really, really neat initiatives and there's more initiatives like this going on right now so because this was such a huge success and here's that article about the the cuckoo bee so you know this is this is a if you build it they will come type of a moment right um all the stuff i've talked about with the nesting things that i've been watching uh this um uh, there is another talk tomorrow night by dr vicker and she um she's going to be talking about how their nesting behavior sort of affects their ecology so it's it'll be a really good talk if you're interested you can check that out off of the alberta native bee council webpage or their facebook page to register it's all free of course um and I think that's it. I know I talk too much, <laughs> but I have so many stories to tell and I never get to tell them all. <laughs> so thank you for listening. Thank you so much for that great presentation. And we do actually have a question sure. in the Q&A here. So it says, if a person can't make their own bumblebee nesting box, where could they get one? Oh, so you could actually, um, what we do for one thing, we have plans for them on the uh, Alberta Native Bee Council page, or I could email you those plans. If you're local, like if you're in Okotoks, I could get one to you, no problem, because I live in, out here in Turner Valley. <laughs> um, so, you know, or even if you're in Calgary, we can certainly make arrangements. So uh, that's not a problem at all, yeah. I'll just give it a minute to see if we have any other questions, if anybody else is typing anything in. Yeah, I'm not see any, seeing anything else, so All right. um, thank you for everyone who joined us virtually today, and thank you, Lexi, for joining us, taking the time to join us and tell us all about me. <laughs> Thanks, and if you have any questions, just uh, get in touch with me through email. Oh, you know what? We just had two quickly come through here. Oh, sure. So it says, can, the first one says, can native bees, like bubble bees, coexist with honeybees? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and so, I mean, we see it in nature, right? Uh, it's not a question of can they coexist. It's more that the more, um, even logistically, the more we bring in, the more and more honeybees we bring in, we are we won't have the resources for everything. So there, there we can create um, situations where there is competition for resources, and so you know in agriculture certainly um, honeybees 
they own that, right? Because there's there, there's millions of them, right? And then so this tends to sort of make those solitary, those other native bees kind of move along. It displaces them, right? And so there's been tons of studies that have shown that. And there's even been, like, that have shown sort of the negative implications that that's had on their reproductive abilities and so on, right? So having to forage, fly too far and use too much energy, then having your offspring more susceptible to predation because either they're gone, right? So there, there, there's huge, there is concern there. And certainly within urban settings, uh, I have huge concern about urban honey beekeeping. I just, I feel like we've got 321 amazing species that need your love. And uh, so, yeah. <laughs> If, if you were going to put in honeybees, I would recommend you, you are turning your entire yard and maybe all your neighbor's yards into patches of flowers because that's what they need, right? I, I'm always baffled by the whole uh, backyard beekeeping, backyard chicken, like having them lumped together in bylaws because to me, as soon as I hear bees and chickens in the same sentence, that tells me that you don't understand the ecology of the organism that you're, you're working with. And it's really important to understand that. So, but I do awesome. love honeybees. <laughs> and our next question is, is it possible to deter honeybees to encourage native bees? I, I don't, I mean, I don't think so. Unless you planted things that specifically you knew only native bees could actually pollinate that honeybees couldn't. Um, but I mean, I, <laughs> I'll go out sometimes and I'll get annoyed because I'll have so many honeybees in my garden. So I'll start bopping them on the head. Like, go, go away. I've got a bumblebee waiting for that flower. And no, they're just always there. <laughs> so, and they're so darn cute. But yeah, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, it's, it's near, you can't deter them. If you got something they want, they're coming for it. <laughs> so, yeah. So we have another question from David, which is, how many native bees get displaced by one honeybee nest? Uh, well, I mean, as far as how many native bees, when you think about, say, one, one typical uh, honeybee colony can eat as much um, provisions as would have fed, say, 100,000 solitary bees. Like, that's, that's a lot of food. So, you know, if you put it into perspectives of when you drive through, say, High River, where they've got, like, 40 of these colony boxes, you're talking about millions and millions of native bees that aren't getting fed, you know, so it's, in my perspective, it's a concern and it's something that should be addressed either by putting in way more bee habitat or just, you know, something like that. So. And then we have another one that says, there are a lot of honeybees in my area. If I planted native flower species, would honeybees take over the pollination or would native bees have a better chance with native flowers? I think for sure, I think native flowers are your best bet for native pollinators. Um, certainly, you're still going to attract honeybees for sure because we'll, we'll see them everywhere anyways, um, but it still might create a bit more of a, where you'll, you will get more native native pollinators, we'd have to hope. <laughs> so uh, there are, like, if you look at some of the literature, and again, if you go to that uh, web page uh, where, where the resource that talks about our native bees, some of the really neat and useful information in there um, relates to specific types of flowers utilized by certain types of native bees. And so that's where you might really get into kind of the specialist stuff um, for attracting maybe more of, you know, many of our native bees are generalists, but maybe you could attract some of the more specialist ones. I don't know, it's, it's yeah. <laughs> Clean water sources. I can see this one. <laughs> I opened it. <laughs> um, I mean, sure, water is good. It's funny thing, though. Like, I, I see honeybees at my, um, whether it's a dog dish or, or uh, bird baths and things all the time. Uh, very often, not, not very often at all do I get to see things like uh, bumblebees and such. So uh, I'm certainly, I'm sure they do like water. I think I, when I asked Dr. Uh, Robin Owens about that, he said that basically they get their moisture from their foraging from their nectar. But I do, I do imagine that they would still have reason for a good clean water source. I don't, I still don't know about putting out things like, um, you know, some people will put out those sugar water bowls and things like that. And you have to remember that anytime you're doing something like that, you could be creating um, a bit of a disease vector location. So <laughs> but just things to consider. 
You know what, Tamara? Um, that's a really good question. Um, having I'm lots just, of natural habitats, awesome. <laughs> I'm just reading it out quick so everybody knows okay. what the... Yeah, oh, sorry, so that's see okay. <laughs> so the Tamara said, which is better, nest boxes or just providing natural habitats that they can make their own nests in? Um, yeah, so, and again, I mean, I would say natural habitat's always the best. One thing we do find is that the more natural habitat you have in your location, the less occupied man-made domiciles tend to be. So um, if, if I was surrounded by um, green space, then I'm less likely to get nesting than if I was in the concrete jungle of, of, of Calgary, which seems backwards, but that does seem to be the trend for whatever reason. So um, so I, I have both, and, and part of that is just because I can't, I mean, my own sheer interest, um, but definitely natural habitat is, I would say, the way to go, yeah. Well, I think that's the last question that we had. Great. So thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Lexi. It was very interesting. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>